Welcome to the Sustainable Dish Podcast. I'm Diana Rogers, a real food registered dietitian, author, and sustainability advocate. I co-host this podcast with James Connolly, who was a producer on my film, Sacred Cow. I also founded the Global Food Justice Alliance, an initiative advocating for the inclusion of animal source foods like meat, dairy, and eggs for a more nutritious, sustainable, and equitable worldwide food system. You can check it out and join me at globalfoodjustice.org. Thanks again for listening, and now on to our show. Too many of us overlook the role of collagen when it comes to having strong bones. Beyond healthy skin, nails, and hair, collagen fortifies your health in several important ways. I want you to learn more about the importance of collagen, so I'm sending my community to review an article from a brand I trust, Native Path. Learn seven reasons why each of us should be consuming more collagen at sustainabledish.com backslash restore. And stick around for how you can save as much as 45% off Native Path Collagen later in this episode. Hi, this is uh, James Connolly uh, with Sustainable Dishes Podcast. Um, I uh, had the opportunity to, well, really, it was actually my fault. It's 100% my fault. Um, I, scrolling on a Saturday morning, uh, came upon a video uh, and decided to sort of rant. I don't know why. It was just, a, I, I tend not to do that unless it's a, there's a few people online I just can't stand. Um, but this was like a good video. It wasn't, there wasn't anything inherently wrong with it, but I, um, it, it was um, some of the things that kind of trigger me are things that are associated with the, the visual imagery that's sort of put in place as a placeholder for the dialogue. Um, and so we started a conversation. Uh, it was with Nat Kelly, uh, who has a large following. She ended up following me at one point. I followed her back. Um, and so I was trying to sort of have a conversation a little bit with her audience. Uh, and then Jenny, Jenny kind of came on uh to sort of like sort of push back and we just had a very good conversation there was nothing accusatory about it uh we just were coming at it from very different perspectives and so i invited her to kind of come on for sustainable dish to kind of just uh uh just have a conversation um so uh so jenny uh i can't do it it's like it just gets into my head say your, say your last name for me <laughs> Anything where there's a pause when people are about to say the name, I'm like, it's me. Okay. And you know, when that's an airport and they're like, name, 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 and then you just see them stutter, I'm like, it's Stoikovich. Yeah, okay. Uh, hi, I'm Jenny Stoikovich. Um, if you pretend the J is a Y sound, it's it's much easier. Okay. Um, in the Cyrillic alphabet, J Y sound. Okay. <laughs> um, so Jenny has written, uh, Jen, uh, Jennifer has written a book called The Future of Food is Female. Uh, I just picked it up. It came to me on Tuesday uh, and today's Thursday. So I only had about two days to read it, but it's a lot of like profiles and vignettes of people who are working in uh, food systems who fundamentally came at it from very different perspectives, uh, all female, lots of women of color, uh, lots of people who their why was very similar and then in ver very ways different. Uh, it's a global perspective. A lot of people who kind of went in and started their own businesses um, uh, came at it from very different global worldview. Uh, but a lot of them were were uh, sort of uh, have become sort of like real champions of uh, plant based eating, uh, sort of vegan um, uh, alternatives to meat. Um, and it's sort of talking about their their journeys as to the whys and wherefores. Uh, it's a great book. It's a, it's actually really good. It um, kind of goes into, um, you know, you always have that sort of like, uh, you know, Paul on the road to Damascus moments where <laughs> you're not from your horse. A lot of people were very successful in their lives and made a fundamental change. Uh, they had all of the trappings of su success in sort of Western ideas and felt unfulfilled and so wanted to kind of work on something. Uh, so it was, it, you know, I'm, I'm about 60, 70% done in. Um, it's, it, you know, it, and it really profiles a lot. Um, now, uh, Jenny also started the Vegan Women's Summit. It's a global platform of more than 40,000 uh, women leaders dedicated to building a kinder, more sustainable world. Um, she's a contributor to Rolling Stone, a public speaker, 
Um, she's written for Bloomberg, Politico, and the Washington Post. Um, so thank you so much for coming on. Um, I would love to go a little bit into sort of your history of the why, um, so that we can tell our audience about that. Yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, so do you want the long or the short? Because I'm, <laughs> I'm an interesting story of how I got involved in foods. Um, I'll You're a you fast talker. Uh, we can go into the long one. Okay. All right, let's do it. So right now I'm here in Los Angeles. You, you can see from my from my background. Um, we, I was not born here. I was born in a small farm town in Canada of about 2,000 people. So I was, I grew up surrounded by cow fields. Uh, I am not this uh, big city person that a lot of people, you know, see today. I really was that kind of farm kid. And what was really interesting about growing up there is I never actually thought about food at all. It was not a thing in my purview. Um, we actually, now that I'm older, I know that it was actually quite a lot of factory farms in our town, um, mostly egg farming. And we we just kind of took for granted that like, that's just the way that they make food. Didn't really think about it. And then when I was 23 years old, um, 10 years ago this November, my entire life changed. Um, my husband's best friend and our best man was murdered. And so this is why I say it's a long story. Um, when you go through something like that, you all of a sudden have your entire world flipped upside down and you are faced with this decision that you've been given this immeasurable piece of grief and you can either learn from it, grow from it, um, make something bigger of yourself, or you can let it sour you. You can let it make you bitter and hard. And so we decided to take the road um, a lot less traveled and we went and forgave the murderer in prison, um, went through this entire murder trial and really just started thinking about what are we, you know, doing with our lives? Um, we think we're these compassionate people. We, you know, go, we, we can forget a murderer, but are we actually doing things in our day-to-day -day life that we think is making the world a better place? Um, so for me, it was really clear, you know, I'm eating factory farm animals three times a day. It's a 90 billion creatures a year. So it was just a very obvious place to start. Uh, so we went vegan. Um, I ended up building like, you know, a pretty big media platform We're probably almost 60,000 women professionals now with BWS, almost 60% non-vegan. It's mostly just women that want to make a, just a tiny one, if a 1% change to this massive system, um, huge untold impact on, on people, planet and animals. So um, that was really my why of, of why I started paying attention to food. I think it has the ability to create an amazing um, way to heal things, heal people's bodies, heal the planet, obviously. Um, and of course, you know, it doesn't need to come at the suffering of, of creatures. And yeah, that's really how I got into it. Um, I worked in Silicon Valley for many years and really just kind of a few years ago thought, if I want to accelerate what I really believe in, I've got to jump in with both feet. So here I am working in the food system. It's so much dirtier than you ever would have thought, too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. You know, working in, I worked for the godfather of Silicon Valley, Ron Conway. So probably not a huge intersection with this audience, but anybody that's worked in tech knows he's literally the, you know, original and angel investor. And we thought that it was really hard to make startups exist. You know, I was working on trying to make Uber and Instacart and all the things that you use today exist. But uh, we kind of took that same approach, I think, with some of the food technology, you know, companies that have emerged. And they're realizing very, very quickly, this is not an app. Food is a very, very different game. Um, food production is a different game. Supply chains are a different game. Uh, and I actually think that's one of the biggest missteps that really happened in the last five years is the interest in investing in food came from that mindset and that mindset's just not applicable to this type of work yeah i you know i, I had um in in around 2008 uh my partner and i uh who's also in venture capital as well um she primarily works with um, female-led female-driven uh venture capital um we we had started a nonprofit um that primarily worked in inner city schools in new york and it was a vegetarian nonprofit because we were prim primarily trying to uh, see how much we can excise a lot of the junk food that was being fed to kids in public schools. Um, we had worked with some of the kids who uh, in the poorest congressional districts in in the country. Um, and so we felt like if we could change that food system, we, we worked through gardening programs, we worked with chefs, uh, you know, we worked with, uh, you know, food suppliers to fundamentally change that because it, for us, it mattered what was sitting on your plate. 
Um, we weren't necessarily anti-meat in any sort of way. Uh, we just thought that the lowest percentage uh, in the American diet is, is fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, and yeah. so we thought we could actually make a big change on that. And we worked with Michelle Obama, um, you know, and, um, you know, so it is really hard. I, you know, like for me, like Michelle is just coming out with her new, uh, she's got a juice company. I think it's 25% juice. And I'm like, come on, Michelle. <laughs> you know? She doesn't actually meet like her own standards. She said that was the thing. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I know. School yeah. lunches, uh, the public school system. I actually, before I was in, uh, in Silicon Valley, my first job in America when I moved here was working at United Way for three years. And I oversaw, I mean, more than 50% of our programs were towards food stamps and children's nutrition. All right, so yeah. oversaw millions of dollars towards, you know, feeding these kids, whether it was making sure they got breakfast all the way to carrying home, you know, their backpack um, filled with dinner. And the products that we had available and who would donate were just terrible we knew they were terrible but it was free food and it was what was available and it's what the kids were taking home yeah and you know i think it, it, especially if you're working in places like agricultural hubs like california you know, the expectation is it's for i mean it's literally happening outside of your door um you know we, we did that for close to a decade we worked in 20 schools we're teaching about 1500 kids a week um and part of the reason why i ended up going into the documentary film space was because i couldn't change the level of conversation around endemic poverty in america and so yeah. every time things were cut they were cut to, to substantive programs that i thought would actually really help in terms of the educational process but take a lot of pressure off the families and i got more and more frustrated with that uh, and so we started looking into funding documentaries that would sort of like do an overall sort of big picture, uh, you know, like conversation about what the food system was. Um, and that that's where I got more and more into agriculture. For me now, I think for the rest of my life, I'll be studying this. I think it's um, uh, one, it's, it is the, the thing that we think about least anymore. And it's probably the most, like the agricultural revolution never ended, right? We live in it. No. Like, no. <laughs> Yeah. You know, TikTok doesn't matter if you can't feed yourself, right? Yeah. yeah, I think, well, the pandemic showed that, right? So, you know, you've had these countries like, say, Singapore, right? I, Singapore is an island nation that during the pandemic, they were importing 95% of their food. Yeah. And they had severe, severe, like, societal collapse level shortages that happened in that country. And so, they looked at themselves and they, they watched the 30 by 30, which I'm not sure if you know about, so the Singapore 30 by 30, and they plan to produce 30% of their own food by 2030 because they never want to have that volatility happen again. And, you know, mm -hmm. you're saying similar in Israel, like all of these countries that don't have, they don't have the embarrassment of riches when it comes to land and crops and everything that we have here in the United States. Like I, I grew up in Canada and, and living here, you just assume that you can grow food. But if you're an island nation, if you're a desert nation, you don't have that ability. Um, and so, yeah, it's been very interesting to see nations take it very seriously. And then I would say, you know, I would say the United States is doing the opposite, um, putting money in all the wrong places when it comes to uh, what they want to see in food. I think like the Inflation Reduction Act was a great example of that. I think there was an opportunity to actually invest in sustainable, durable food solutions for the future of this country. And it mostly just turned into handouts to the same usual folks that have most of the handouts, right? Yeah, and that that was, you know, I remember seeing that um, it was uh, Michael Pollan had written an op-ed for the New York Times um, as Michelle Obama was, was, was launching her Let's Move program. She was standing up there with a lot of multinationals, PepsiCo and, uh, you know, companies like that. Um, you had on that same day, uh, Barack Obama was signing away the farm bill. Uh, and so that is probably one of the largest, you know, um, corporate giveaways you could possibly ever imagine. Um, and it's been like that for a real long time. I've been doing a lot of research into uh, the commodities markets, uh, specifically ADM, Bungie, Cargill, and, uh, and Dreyfus. Um, and one of the things that I actually kind of want to ask you your wisdom on this, because it's a quote that I thought is really interesting. Um, Dwayne Andreas was uh, the CEO of ADM from the 1970s up until about 1995. Um, and he has this sort of quote, um, he said uh, something to the effect of uh, the customer is our enemy, uh, our, uh, <laughs> right? So you go, <laughs> the customer is our enemy, the competitors are our friends. 
Uh, and it starts off there. He said, um, and I want to like go into the quote a little bit here. We're the biggest food and agriculture company in the world. Uh, this is this is a little bit. It was about a decade ago. Uh, how is the government going to run without people like us? We make thirty five percent of the bread in this country, and that much of the margarine and cooking oil and all of the other things. Um, and so he's his argument was that this is a socialist country. What we do is we take enormous amounts of taxpayer wealth and we fund it into these programs that that are sort of parasitical to the agricultural system that pull all of this wealth away from the farms. Um, and then process them, make them into these foods that are shelf stable, that are uh, like low input, low cost foods that then we can then like essentially just throw it all over the world. Um, and yeah. so the process, the ultra processed food revolution was essentially that we excise the taxpayer wealth that was associated with all of this agricultural productivity and then just dump the world with a ton of ultra processed foods. You know, and the, and the long-term cost of that is what, you know, you and I are kind of dealing with, right? We have the pharmaceuticals that are dealing with some of the aspects of that. Uh, then we also have all of the downstream effects, the environmental damage that the, also the taxpayer has to pay for. Um, and then all of the other things that are kind of associated with that, that are downstream effects, like, you know, the, the medical, uh, like health system that has to deal with what are considered like lifestyle diseases, right? Um, which I hate yes. the term lifestyle diseases. Like it's if you have a choice when you walk through the supermarket. <laughs> I know, Jim. I could. There's like a thousand points you just said that I have a lot yeah. of thoughts on. I mean, it's not, Bear and Monsanto are the same company. Okay, like let's right. start there. Right. Right. Fifty percent of antibiotics produced in the United States are for livestock. So to assume that the pharmaceutical industry and you know and CAFOs and and the top four meat giants in this country are not all together in cahoots is just absurd they are and they have been yeah. for a very long time it's actually a topic that i think is not covered a lot is you know in 1971 when we decoupled the dollar um from the gold standard you know nixon's decision mm -hmm. we really actually saw a Massive escalation in subsidies towards factory farming and intensification, um, which of course is also related to, you know, the corn and, and all the other types of um, what would become processed foods, right? And so, if you look, you actually can see that they firmly believe that moving towards that process, that ultra processed industrialized food system, you can see like some some of the um, leaders in government in the early '70s said. This is how we are going to feed America. This was by intention and, and on purpose. This isn't a, oh, you know, the US government, you know, thought it's same with the UK. They're one of the first countries that also started subsidizing industrialized intensive farming. Um, they, this, this didn't happen to them, it happened with them. Uh, and so now we're in a system where you've got 85% of like meat is being processed by four giant corporations and they sign right. deals with these small, you know, pork, pig, and, and beef ranchers that are making almost nothing. I think the average beef rancher is now upside down. I don't even, I think the actual average is literally in the negative. Tyson reported the pork pro uh, producers were in negative margins two quarters ago, and they're stuck in this system because that meat processor puts them in debt, millions and millions and millions of dollars, because you have to buy the Tyson approved or the, yeah. you know, Hormel approved entire setup. And then you're working that off for decades, right? So you have no way to actually get out of that, you know, way means of production. You have no way to really find your way out of that hole. And I think that's the piece that both people that don't want to, you know, both the vegan plant-based side, the regenerative side really are missing out on is there is this perverse financial model that has trapped so many of these farmers. And like, what are they going to do, right? And we've got the beef ranchers who on average are a decade older than a pork or chicken producer. They're all 65, yeah. 70 now. And they, they've got a, a, a sinking asset and their kids don't want it. Yeah. So why would they, right? Yeah, and what, what we saw uh, post 2008 was uh, the new markets uh, for a lot of uh, college endowments, uh, for insurance agencies, for uh, a lot of financial capital was to go past the fence posts of these farms to essentially take them over. And you've taken a lot of these farmers and now you've made them essentially tenant farmers. Uh, they no longer own the land, uh, the inputs are decided for them. And this is this is across the entire market. I think um, if you look at California agriculture, if you look at, uh, you know, even just the, the 
almonds, uh, coconuts, uh, the sort of global enterprise, um, palm oil production. Uh, we, we can actually see it in cattle farming in Sudan, where you have these, um, you know, uh, Harvard got in trouble because they were involved in Brazilian deforestation. Uh, so you have these like $42 billion endowments that are very small very nimble, maybe five or six people make these decisions and they're willing to go into these new venture markets because it'll, it, you can actually exercise a tremendous amount of wealth. Um, and so 2008 was really a fundamental change, I think, in our agricultural system. We're seeing the end tail result of that, which is uh, pesticide uh, companies, there's about four in the world right now, uh, fertilizer companies, there's about four in the world. We see the total consolidation of every single aspect of this market. And I think that 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 to me was the sort of bugbear that kind of like threw me off, like got me a little bit riled up uh, about the video um, that was centered around the uh, consumer freedom and consumer choice. Um, yeah. And I think when I, when I hear that, and this is a, like whenever I'm interviewed or I'm talking about some of this stuff, like uh, Iowa pig farmers do not want this type of pig farming. The farmers downstream of these plants, nobody wants this and they can't get out. And so I think um, I was reading uh, Swine Republic recently and they said, it was close to like 20 years ago, you had 280,000 uh, farmers involved in pig and egg laying production. Uh, but also soy, corn, uh, you know, essentially whatever grows in Iowa, these integrated systems, we're down to about 85,000. So you've, pro you've produced enormous amount of pro productivity, but you've essentially bankrupted small towns, small communities, um, you know, you've essentially like unhoused them uh, and unmoored them from all of the different civic responsibilities associated with the money that would have come in from this farming. Um, and yeah. so the downstream cost of that is essentially paid for by everybody else, right? Uh, the Mississippi Delta, the, the dead, you know, streams that we're seeing, the phosphate fertilizers that are sort of running off and leaching into that environment that we also have to pay for, right? So now we've all these watch groups that are kind of part of that, that are trying to, yeah. to reduce nitrate and phosphate production. And they're like, what are we going to do? Like, you know, it's since they've instituted these policies, it's even, it's gone up even since then. You know, and so we're yeah. stuck. Like that's the problem. We're stuck. We're stuck in the system, and the consumer is the end result of that. They they given the illusion that they have like when they walk through the supermarket that they have this sort of like bounty that's sitting in front of them, but really it's about like ten companies that own eighty percent of the foods that are sitting in there. You know, I I totally agree. I think that you know we've got both the domestic consolidation that's happened certainly in the meat, you know, dairy and egg industry, particularly in chicken and pork, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we've also got the foreign influence too that's been happening in the United States. And when you get into the fact that Arizona had to halt construction in two Western Phoenix neighborhoods because Mondamonte, a Saudi Arabian dairy company had pulled so much water from the water table to grow their alfalfa that American citizens are going without water, right? Like I did an entire expose on this a few months ago and I filmed actually a documentary with some folks a few months ago on the water shortage. And Americans have no idea that not only have we sold your water to, to feed essentially livestock, typically alfalfa, but we've sold it to cows in China and Saudi Arabia and Japan. It's not even yeah. cattle in the United States. And then when you think about water rights, you think about these farmers have these water rights, 100 year plus, um, you know, legislation. It's very Byzantine and complex and weird. We're only right. just diving into it for the first time this year because the Colorado is going to Deadpool in two different spots, right? So for those that are not familiar, you've got almost eight different states that are that are using the Colorado River. It's an arterial water system in the United States. Obviously, the big one being California is on it. 40 million Americans, that's one in eight, you know, people that are using this water system that 70% of it's going to alfalfa production. Two thirds of all of Utah's entire water footprint, like including commercial, residential, everything is alfalfa. They pull that stuff out of the ground, pack it up, put it on a ship, and then it goes to China. Mm -hmm. How is there not been some, you know, like, how is there not a basic right that Americans should have a right to water before a foreign entity does? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that that the financialization of farmland post two thousand eight was really, I think, where it galvanized a lot of that. I mean, the the U.S. does this everywhere, 
um, you know, you, you've posted about this as well, right? Uh, that uh, U.S. Supreme Court case involving Cargill, Mars, uh, Hershey, and um, uh, Nestle, um, you know, uh, utilizing uh, child slavery in chocolate production in West Africa. Uh, we see this across the board in coffee production. We see this across the board. Um, the Saudis actually did find a uh, an aquifer that they tried to tap to grow their own alfalfa, and it was dead within ten years. Um, and so they they tried to find some degree of like, you know, sustainability on their own front, and they just drained a ten thousand year aquifer in in a decade. Saudi Arabia, I run, I tell this to people all the time. Saudi Arabia is drying up Arizona because in twenty eighteen they banned alfalfa farming in their own country. Yeah. How much more do you need? And and I think that even now we're seeing this onshore. This isn't even offshore. You know, the processing giants we just had this week, Department of Labor announced an investigation to both Tyson and Purdue for using 13-year-old undocumented children in, you know, slaughterhouses. We had JBS implicated three months ago. We are facing such dire consequences of cheap meat. And there are only a few people winning. People like Donnie King, the CEO of Tyson Foods that made $12 million last year, he's winning. But, you know, uh, Marcos uh, Suze, who lost an arm in a Tyson factory, 13 years old, should have been in eighth grade that day. He's not. Like, what is, at what point is the human cost of this level of, of food consolidation and processing too much for us, right? Yeah, and you know that has been. I, I was recently reading. Um, so, like I was saying before, I've I've moved away from a lot of the uh, some of the arguments that were that were put forth in Sacred Cow, um, and one of the things I've become obsessed with was the sort of demonization of psychedelics and. Um, uh, 1970s drug culture. <laughs> so, so I picked up. Um, so, one of my favorite writers is a guy by the name of Eric Schlosser, um, and he wrote he wrote this amazing small a short book. It's called Gods of Metal, and it's about these um, these nuns and priests who break into military the the top secret military facilities um, that are housing like nuclear weapons, and they they just they're seven years old and they walk onto these things and they protest. <laughs> And it's a really great, it's like a short book. Um, but he wrote a book called Reefer Madness. And it's a weird book because it goes through yeah, three, yeah. yeah, he goes through three specific um, like aspects of American culture. One is the obviously the drug culture, the anti-psychedelics, uh, the anti-LSD, all of that stuff, but also marijuana production. So as you saw farmers start to lose more and more market share, a lot of moved into the illegal trade. Uh, their, their farms were seized. Uh, because they, they had no ability to make any money anymore. Um, and yeah. they would get these like 24, 25 year sentences, mandatory seizures. Uh, police departments started to go after them because they could get million dollar properties um, by just finding a marijuana plant or a few marijuana plants like growing behind it. But the secondary part of it was he goes into this long form uh, conversation about strawberry production. And it is the one of the most, I read the worst things that humans can do to each other. It is the one of the worst things I have ever read uh, in, in my adult life. Uh, strawberry production in California is just so devastating. Um, and so I think that there are so many sort of aspects of it that I think, you know, I like I, JBS, I, we did a whole sort of uh, podcast, uh, Chloe Servino's book, uh, Raw Deal. Uh, JBS, like the fact that they're even in this country, considering what they did in terms of bribery and scandals, uh, in terms of production, um, you know, Right. Literally the only to prison. <laughs> yeah, I think one did go to prison, right? No, both. The two owners went oh, to prison okay. in a jail cell in Brazil as we cut bailout checks to them during the pandemic. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a, and and it, you know, and JBS is on track to list on, on the stock exchange this year in the United States. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, you talk about uh, factory, factory production, chicken production, JBS, uh, where people who are working there can't even afford the chickens that they're processing. Like the the timing on all of this stuff, the mechanization of that entire process means that people are really, but that, that is like every single aspect of our food now is, is laden with pesticide exposure, um, you know, birth defects associated with that, um, you know, 2A visas, uh, exploitation throughout the entire system. And every time we de demonize immigration, 
uh, we, we move uh, and legislate towards more prisons for nonviolent criminals so that we can farm them out uh, for agricultural production. So you see this sort of like duality that happens within our agricultural system where we're always just looking for the, you know, the most marginalized people that people would, you know, like, and then utilizing them and essentially creating uh, like an underclass of invisible people that we can continuously exploit. And, you know, the yeah. suicide rates among migrant agricultural workers in both meat production and agricultural production is one of the highest in the United States. So you, you're putting people into this enormous amount of penury where they, they can't ever really get out. Uh, they have to pay in order to, to get to these um, uh, coyotes. Uh, and then yeah. they essentially spend an entire life trying to pay off all of the debt that they've accrued trying yeah. to get here. Um, and so this whole system, like I, I agree with you, this whole system's like just so broken in <laughs> so many different ways. Because it's like, okay, so we've now exploited almost every aspect. All these ingredients that you're eating are either been synthesized in a lab or been probably gone through, you know, essentially human trafficking hands, right? right. And it gets to you at the grocery store and you're a mom and it's, you know, 535 and you got to pick up something quick to eat because you got three kids at home and you go to the frozen pizza aisle, which is an invention of America, might I add. We, no other grocery stores in the world have an entire aisle. aisle? For <laughs> That's not normal. Okay. So like just FYI to anybody listening and you take it home and you feed your kids that same crap because it's, the, it's what's cheap. It's what's available. And before you know it, your 12 year old needs their Zempic. And then the entire cycle, you know, is beginning because we have a diabetes epidemic. We know the diabetes, you know, you say lifestyle disease, it's, I mean, it's a terrible name because it's basically for most people like food disease. It's the crap you're eating. You're eating sugary, ultra processed foods that are filled with a bunch of red meat and dairy, all that combines together. And you end up with 20% of teenagers in the United States being eligible for a serious pharmaceutical weight loss drug. Like we're yeah. starting to get new numbers in now. They have now estimated that 70%, 70% of Americans qualify for Ozempic. Yeah. And this is an entire topic that we went three years of a pandemic and we literally never talked about this, which is the second most prevalent comorbidity aside from age was obesity and, and, and weight. And we have an inability to actually like discuss this meaningfully as a society. We just decided to create more pharmaceuticals. Like Harvard Medical um, School found that they think that Ozempic alone could increase U.S. healthcare costs by fifty percent. <laughs> and how you know? And this this gets into this broader picture of these are the foods that are available to people. These are the foods that are making them sick. They're making them sick earlier and earlier in life. And now we're going to foot the bill for a lifetime of illnesses. New generations, you know, Gen Z is has some of the worst, you know, early signs of, of diabetes and, and weight issues and things like that. Like they're going to sit on the system their entire life because of this. And it all starts with the food. We know it all starts with the food. We yeah. refuse to take it on as a public health issue. Why is that? I'm picking up where I left off earlier about collagen. Native Path Collagen is a brand that you can trust and is the collagen that I personally use and I recommend as a dietitian. I've noticed a big improvement in my hair, skin, and nails since I've started using this collagen supplement and I've noticed that my joints feel a lot better too. Sourced from only pasture-raised bovine hide, Native Path has only one ingredient and it's 100% hydrolyzed. Every scoop of Native Path grass-fed collagen is consistently formulated with 10 grams of the highest quality grass-fed type 1 and type 3 collagen, which make up 90% of the collagen in your body. Native Path collagen is completely flavorless and blends smooth into any liquid, hot or cold. Get Native Path collagen as low as 45% off plus free shipping. Just head to sustainabledish.com backslash Native Path to get this deal and to start restoring your health with Native Path grass-fed collagen. You know, because I think it, I, I think we turned into a corporatocracy. Corporatocracy? Corporate. Oh, I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> corporatocracy. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think I think when you hear uh, Vilsack, who is the head of the uh, 
you know, the, the USDA, uh, the sort of revolving door between, uh, you know, a lot of the agricultural sort of products and, and the USDA. Uh, you hear him talk, he was on Sustainable uh, his podcast, that is Tamar Haspel was a writer for Washington Post, um, and Michael Grunewald. Um, and so they have an interview with him and he says, listen, we're going to let the markets decide what is viable. Um, and that is his answer for everything. The markets, they, they seem in his mind have this, um, uh, they're agendaless, right? Because essentially it's, oh, it's considered yeah. the, the best, you know, the best competition, the best product wins. And I'm just like, you, you don't understand how much of the finger is on the scale of people who just made all of this money uh, for years off of that, right? Um, and so like, for me, the, the, the farmers are the, like you said before, the farmers are the end result of a product that they didn't, they have to sign contracts that, that put them into this place where even if they complain about it, they will get worse chickens. They'll get downgraded chickens. They will, uh, their slaughter dates will get moved. Um, so they, the pork processors, the meat processors have essentially hijacked every part of this agenda. Um, and a lot of these farmers are older. They can't pass on the land to their children anymore because they can't have uh, two income households in the same place. So the children are forced to leave. Um, and so we have an entire generation of people who are retiring out of this business uh, and then we don't really have a younger generation. Um, you know, I, I interview them all the time. There are people who kind of came at um, like regenerative agriculture or some some other form of agriculture outside of this system um, and have tried to sort of work through that system out, outside of that system, uh, either direct to consumer uh, or leveraging uh, existing relationships in order to excise themselves from all of that. Um, but but the the meat packing still is the biggest problem and biden gave a billion dollars a billion dollars means absolutely nothing uh for small regional slaughterhouses and you know who like has the best lawyers and best bankers who could possibly get that uh, get that money in some sort of weird like you know fashion through an llc it'll be jbs it'll be cargill it'll be the same companies you know and that's that's you know at the end of the day of what I dedicate a lot of my career and time to is if we if we want to move away from industrialized meat production and we do not think that people are going to precipitously drop their meat consumption, which we are now off the chart, you know, we're eating more and more meat every single day. We find new and new, there's new ways to put meat into food all of the time, right? The you see, if, if you see the like four cheese, like taco, like Guadalupe, whatever kind of thing release, that's right. because the Dairy Council had them release it. We know mm -hmm. for a fact that fast food like releases are based upon excess demand that you have the National Dairy Council or the Beef Council gets involved and pushes them to actually release these products, right? So we know that people are eating a lot, a lot, a lot of meat. And we've got China as a great example of when you have a rapid industrialization of a nation, they start eating a more Western diet, which means more meat. We know that China is the same, or, um, with India could be on the same track. And of course, Africa, as you mentioned, like that's kind of the last frontier, so to speak, and why there's such a huge land grab happening there. So if we want to move away from that system, I believe fundamentally that you need to have a large scale production of protein that has different inputs. And that's why we focus on, you know, what could large scale like plant-based protein with, you know, if you eat plant-based protein for the 30% of the time you're eating processed meats or more, depending on which American you are, and then you've got a steak or whatever, you know, piece of chicken that's locally farmed for Sunday night, there has to be some sort of balance in my opinion, because the numbers aren't gonna work out for either one, unless they are brought together to address the way that factory farming is currently working. Right. I mean, it, um, yeah, I, you know, I think about that a lot. Um, one of the, um, one of the things that Diana and I um, have argued about incessantly is um, like, what is the end result of a massive reduction in meat? Um, it is usually the first thing that's taken off the table in schools. Uh, it's usually the first thing that is um, you're going to look for uh, with people who are already living in food deserts, are already struggling to make ends meet. Um, most Americans could not put together $400 if they had an emergency. Um, or we live off of our we live off of paycheck to paycheck. 
Um, and so from my perspective, it's always really difficult to see what would happen with that. If prices rose, um, if those those things became choices, the people who um, who have the ability to afford that will obviously get that. And I, I consider the benefits of meat consumption to outweigh the, the, uh, the costs um, in terms of health. I think a lot of meat is, and we don't really eat like meat anymore. We eat essentially muscle. Um, I don't eat that way, um, you know, so I try to eat whole animal. I, I've tried as much as possible to excise myself from the entire system, um, you know, like food system, um, you know, as, as much as you possibly can, um, you know, but That's I think that there's 100%. Yeah. The fact you that know. you and I get to choose our diets. Yeah. But like the organics movement, um, I remember Michael Pollan talks about it. He said the the original organics movement, the average um, like annual uh, like paycheck that people were bringing home was was under twenty seven thousand dollars. There were people who were making choices to eat organic um, that that really didn't factor into the larger scale. They this was an important factor for them. Um, and so for me, like you know, it's it's where you choose to sort of pay into um, that can sometimes make a big difference. Um, you know, I think like when I look at um, social justice issues like the Black Panthers, which is, which which was a vegetarian organization uh, that fed kids in the inner city because they realized education uh, was useless if kids were hungry in the classroom. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like there are so many sort of aspects of this that are like we can't. I don't know. It's it's sort of hard to go through the social justice issues and you know in the time that we have that are kind of associated with like what do we eat. Um, like what is what is a moral diet? What is you know like what is uh, a diet that that could could possibly excise yourself from uh, this entire system, uh, especially if you're not given choice, right? Public schools, you're not really given that much choice, um, you know. So, so ahead, you're I'll given. stop talking. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 you're given Tyson nuggets, right? That that is what is served in most U.S. public schools, right? And so. I think that the health aspects of meat that you're thinking about are not present in the majority of meat products that are consumed in the United States. Most meat products, mm. the, the top selling meat product in the U.S. is uh, Tyson and Nugget. So right. if you look at the top five selling meat products in the U.S., only one is, is actually an unprocessed meat and it's a chicken breast. The other four are all processed meat. So from a health perspective, if we can replace those items with either a plant-based protein and alternative protein, more fruits and vegetables. That one seems like a tall order because less than 10% of Americans eat the recommended fruits and vegetables. If we can replace that piece and then they keep and they have a, you know, reduced meat consumption of healthier meat, that's great. I think that's the best chance we've actually got for us to create a healthier, more robust, sustainable food system. But I don't see Americans suddenly turning away from factory farm processed meat at the prices that they're at to only eat a small amount of regenerative healthy meat. It just, we've never done that. We've never seen consumers ever reduce in mass this type of thing, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I, 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 when I, when I think about this stuff, I always say to myself, well, like what is the larger keystone issue um, that, that matters to me most, which is uh, we've seen CEO pay go up. Uh, we have seen, um, right? So yeah. we have seen uh, probably, the largest wealth gap uh, in 70 years um, happening right now. Uh, we saw the total like 2.3 to $3 trillion of, of wealth essentially transferred to billionaires. Um, and so um, I don't know. I, I, I think one of the harder parts that I have with a lot of this stuff is that, and, and this happens a lot with, uh, with uh, podcasts about health, is the consumer is... Um, given limited choice because of all of the other in, uh, extrinsic factors uh, that aren't associated with what they're sitting down to a meal with, um, you know? And so I don't necessarily know what to do with that because that is just as insurmountable as changing the agricultural system. <laughs> right? um, but, I, but I also like, don't want to necessarily blame the consumer. Like if you're not given, if you're not given the choice if you if you live within the system, um, so uh, sorry, like a small analogy to this. Um, there's a book called The Invention of Capitalism, um, and it's it one of the stories that's told in that 
uh, was about the sort of movement of people into the industrialized, um, you know, uh, into industrialization. You had to work, up, get them to work in factories. Uh, none of them wanted this. Uh, they hunted when they want, they gardened, uh, they had to pay their, uh, their produce tax uh, and pay their taxes to uh, the noblemen. Um, but for the most part, they were semi left alone, except in times of crisis. But in order to get people to do a job, that had no intrinsic value to them, where they'd work 60, 70 hours a week on, you had to essentially excise them from everything that was, uh, that would allow them to kind of like eat and live on their own. Um, and so a lot of our educational system, a lot of our sort of like corporate uh, industrial system is to excise you from your ability to kind of take, make those choices in and of yourself. Um, and so it worked, right? It worked for industrialization, it worked for capital, uh, development in, in the industrialized West uh, made a lot of money for a very small percentage of people. Um, but the cost of that was that we now have very little relationship to where our food is coming from. Um, and I, I consider some of that to be intentional, right? So a, a lot of our knee-jerk reactions associated with this is, is the end result of a larger system uh, that was never really meant to either one, give us long-term health, uh, to give us like access and mobility and happiness, <laughs> like <laughs> solace, peace of mind, you know, yeah. all those other was not Was not solving for <laughs> happiness, that's for sure, right? It is solving yeah. for economies of scale. That's, yeah. That is what our entire food system is. And I think the issue that we're now facing is we're reaching very real long-term effects in American society and in Western society of what this system has done to us. I think it took a while to get here. Uh, and honestly, we weren't eating this, we weren't eating this way, um, you know, several decades ago. This is a fairly modern mm -hmm. advancement in the American diet or advancement using used loosely. But we've got the ability to now have that hindsight and we see other nations that have much larger populations fast tracking to what we're doing and that to me is the most concerning part you know there's a reason why china owns a large amount of uh in russia now increasingly of africa of that continent because yeah. that's where the next economic boom is going to be you look at places like lagos you know there is massive massive changes that are happening that people have no idea on a global scale and if that adoption of that diet is going to happen in these places as well We've got really serious sustainability concerns. We've got some very serious health concerns. There's, this is a point I believe, you know, I don't know when we hit a point of no return, but for a lot of us, I think the what's happened in China was was really like, whoa, rice fields to skyscrapers in only a few decades. And, and if that is going to happen in India next, and that's going to happen across the continent of Africa next, how do we make sure that we're doing that sustainably? How do we stop that? How do we tell other nations to not do what we're doing right like how right. how is that going to work like is what is the moral implication of that what is the moral implication that we could be using more renewable energy but we don't and then we chastise india for using coal and like well we need to provide en energy for our folks you know you guys have the ability you're a, a few hundred years ahead you guys could be using better energy sources you can't tell us what to do and that's going to keep happening more and more. And I feel like we have an obligation in Western society and American society to make those changes that we can, because we know that there are developing nations that could mirror this, um, that will have disproportionate effects on the planet. Yeah. But uh, like for me, a lot of that is predicated upon the idea that we just said, uh, like, just business as usual, that we continue to produce yeah. like everything uh, just for its own sake. Um, you know, the original sort of promise uh, that like Keynesian economics would kind of talk about, he said that by the end of the century, people would work about 15 hours a week. Right? <laughs> We'd have most of our things. You know. You know, they're apparently going to get us uh, out of work soon with these uh, AI entities. So. <laughs> yeah, but it's, a, it's only replaced art, right? It's only replaced like, you know, screenwriters and artists and everything like that. It just took away all of the poetry. <laughs> no, James, if I told you, I've got a, I know Sam Altman and I know what's going on over at OpenAI and if the public knew the stuff they're working on, <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. It's, it's much, much deeper. Uh, the autumn, I mean, that's, that is the, that's the irony of the whole thing. It's that, you know, as we modernize, we theoretically should be working less and having more value. We are improving things and everything improves except for 
the quality of life of people. Uh, and I think that is really, that's, that's the break in, I, we don't have capitalism when it comes to the overarching food system because we have such insane subsidizing from the government. Like we have an oligopoly. We have an oligopoly that controls the way that we eat, um, that, you know, you're trying to break through, we're trying to break through. And uh, the concern is that if that breakthrough doesn't happen and business as usual does continue, there could be a pretty scary future. You know, I think about when I see what's happening with, with kids in the school system, what they're feeding, like the illnesses they're getting earlier and earlier, what you see, you know, happening with these communities that are outside of Smithfield that, you know, they successfully sued um, for, for the insane pollution um, that was causing respiratory ailments, cancers, things like that. It almost feels like we're heading for a Wally type situation. Have you seen Wally? Of course. Like Clark Mountain? Yeah. It feels of course correct. That's where we'd be going. Just um blink, consumerist planet where we've all tuned tuned out completely. Yeah, I think I, I think one of my lowest moments we we were, we're having a conversation with um uh with uh the US military, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and they looked at um obesity rates and army recruitment. Uh and so people really couldn't fit into tanks anymore. Uh, and so uh, they looked at the problem. They looked at the problem in the United States, and they were like, "Okay, robotics and drones. <laughs> we're just gonna we're just gonna play video games now, right?" Yeah. And it's, uh, well, that's, it's absurd. Yeah, but that was the only way that they can look around what the system was. Um, and so you have national security. They called it a national security issue, but then they had absolutely no idea how to push back against that stuff. You know. And that's emblematic i think of, of where we are right now in society is that we are just doing workarounds to core fundamental broken pieces it's that it's it's all harm mitigation that's happening right now because the actual real fundamental issues that we're facing you know with the inequality of you know there's there's just so much that needs to be unpacked layer by layer that throwing these simple solutions on top until it finally, you know, the dam breaks and it's too much, that's the way that we're going to keep heading. And I think that it's wrong. I think that we, folks that are listening, you know, folks like you and I, we call it out, we say it like it is, um, but to get people that inertia to combat that status quo, is it's very, very difficult. Um, and I don't know. We've had small groups that have created big waves before, but generally speaking, every social justice movement is underpinned by some sort of technological revolution as well that does make, you know, whatever it is obsolete. We've seen this countless times before. Um, so that's what I, I believe, you know, working in what I do is that technological revolution that can underpin what I think is one of the biggest societal, you know, reforms we need to do will hopefully accelerate it and make it a reality. So Buckminster Fuller, is that the quote? Uh, Which you one? can't you can't change society by um, by fighting the current paradigm. You have to create a new um, uh, way. Like, I, 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 yeah, I think that we've 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 got the data to see. The cultural shift is important. The cultural revolution is it's key, of course, right? But there has to be an economic driver underneath it. There has to be. And until we have both pieces together, we're spinning our wheels. You can't do just the economic technological innovation and not have the cultural piece. I think that's something that the work that I do has done very unsuccessfully, to be completely honest. I think we haven't built enough cultural support for the type of food technology we're trying to build and vice versa. You know, there's so many farmers that are they know what's wrong. They do these documentaries. They're out there in front of, you know, the hill every five years and they just keep getting steamrolled. They just keep getting it. So how do we pair the two together? Yeah, I, um, it's two o'clock. I don't necessarily want to keep you for too long, but I did have yeah. like one question that I, I wanted your wisdom on. Um, okay. One of the things I've, I've, I've been thinking a lot about lately is um, the sense that we have um, I think the original organics movement, either coming out of Berkeley or uh, sort of like working with indigenous wisdom uh, to, to work on agricultural practices would have been considered to be um, sort of harkening back to a different time. Um, one of the things I found sort of fascinating about some of the technological uh, aspects of the sort of novel foods movement uh, was that I, 
I don't necessarily understand why technology then became uh, the major driver for that. I um, it never really made that much sense to me because it seems to, um, you know, it's it for me it seems like a, a laboratory and a factory very akin to the problems that we're trying to address. Um, you know, and, and maybe it's a longer form uh, conversation because we actually didn't even get into <laughs> lab grown meat or anything like that, right? We didn't go to any of that stuff. Uh, so maybe we could just like, but it, it's, it's so interesting to me because it, it, I think working on some of those issues, I, I don't necessarily understand why tech then became the answer to some of these fundamental questions. You know? So there's, I think there's a couple of things and I could talk for another hour about this. I talk about yeah. the ethics of these things all the time, but... So from a pure protein production scale, if we assume that people want to continue to consume in the way that they do, the only real solution is going to be a technological underpinning, right? So that's the thesis around it is assuming meat consumption continues going up to either stay the same or go up, which is what is happening. It's going up globally by almost 2%. Then we need to slot in a new scalable system that will work so that is the reason behind that now the cultural piece of it of why are we talking about technology and labs and things like that when it comes to food i think that's a different conversation because i think that there is a severe disconnect from the people that are working on this science and understanding the food and the consumer and the tradition around the way that we eat I think that's a misstep that's been taken by this industry because there's just not enough conversation with the consumer to make them comfortable with these products. Um, I think that it's something I talk about a lot. It's a big piece of the future of food is female. 93% of consumer food purchases are made by women, yet every single one of these modern kind of novel food companies is almost essentially always led by a male leader. And you can see it. You can see it in the dialogue that's emerged. You can see it in the way this industry has unfolded. And I think it's a mistake. It's a mistake. I think there needs to be more moms. There needs to be more women. Um, you see it when you go to the grocery store. You see husbands that are FaceTiming their wives, like figuring out which food to buy. Women control the grocery carts of this world. And I think our approach to explaining these food technologies and the why and talking to those that make these purchasing decisions would be much more effective. So to answer your question, that's why technology. And that's how we um, screwed it up. In my opinion, in these very short few years, um, we've kind of lost the mark for for controlling the narrative in a way that consumers feel comfortable. And I hope to correct that. And I hope that conversations like this hope to correct that so you understand where it's coming from. Nobody's here to take your meat. We're actually just trying to give you more protein options um, that you have diversity because you don't have diversity and you don't have choice right now. Um, and we believe that we can make consumer choice ultimately. Cool. Thank you. That was very succinct. <laughs> I hope um, that answers it, but we can crack open a whole new conversation another day. Oh my on. God. Yeah. I think we should do it. We'll do it again. Um, okay. Uh, well, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, and taking the time uh, out of your busy schedule uh, to have this conversation, you know. I, I appreciate it. I am happy to join anytime. And if you've ever got, if folks have questions about any of these novel food technologies, please know that I am a resource. I, I talk to the press every day and provide this kind of expertise because there's not a lot of people that know what they're talking about. Uh, and there's a lot of misinformation that's going on out there. So um, please consult real reliable resources before forming opinions on some of these new approaches, because I promise you uh, there's no scary stuff going on. We just have done a bad job explaining what we're trying to do. All right, well, thank you so much. If you're looking for a guide to help you get your diet back on track, to help you feel your very best, and to learn more about meat's role in a healthy and sustainable and ethical food system, then I highly recommend you take my Sustainable course. I've condensed all of my knowledge in human nutrition and agriculture and have made it accessible to everyone in eight easy modules. There are quizzes, tips, and motivational emails to keep you on your journey. It also comes with a free cookbook and other great bonuses. So eat for your health, the planet, and your values. Head to sustainavore.com today and check it out. Hey. 
Hey everyone, Diana here. I wanted to let you know that after many years and over 1 million downloads of the Sustainable Dish podcast, I've decided it's time to direct my attention to other projects, including the Global Food Justice Alliance. It's been a true honor to interview so many important leaders in the health and agricultural fields, and I've loved every minute of it. So October 31st, 2023 will be the last episode Thank you so much for all of my dedicated listeners out there, for your attention, your time. Thank you to Emily, my podcast editor, and to James Connolly, my co-host. Be sure to follow me at Global Food Justice and also at Sustainable Dish. You can get my newsletters, help contribute to the mission that I'm working on to make sure that all people have access to nutrient-dense animal source foods. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening today and for following my work. If you believe in making sure people all over the world should have access to nutritious food, please join my mission through my nonprofit, the Global Food Justice Alliance. Visit sustainabledish.com backslash join and become a sustaining member today. All sustaining members get free downloads and you'll be helping get healthy protein like meat, fish, and eggs to food insecure kids. That's sustainabledish.com backslash join. And thank you.